Ooh, man, a lot of y'all seem to be pretty upset at this game. And if my rage yelling after I ended up dying and having to retry one train ride for the 28th time says anything, maybe it's a little justified. Callisto Protocol has a problem, but I think a lot of people are seeing it through the wrong lens and expecting it to be something it never was. So I've been told from time to time that I have gaming in the name of my channel, yet I cover science and lately movies. So where exactly is the gaming? Well, let's get into it, you giant nerd, because really the realist remember, I have actually done a few game reviews and comprehensive breakdowns in the past. Agony, for instance, is still in this channel, and I still claim to this day that it was actually agony to play. Callisto Protocol, however, was actually pretty fun. With some rough points, yeah, they were pretty frustrating. So let's get into what made Callisto Protocol so ah. Uh, actually, never mind, that's Ackman's thing. Let's get into why this game is sort of like the younger brother of a gifted student. The expectations may be placed a little too high. And bear with me, I'm writing this on four hours of sleep, and I have a cold currently, so I wouldn't say my brain is working at max capacity. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. So the holidays are officially on us, and if you haven't been eating terrible like I have, then really, I guess good on you. Because for the rest of us, eating healthy can be difficult to do because it's like the whole meal prep thing and it's kind of difficult. Factor takes care of that part with fresh, never frozen meals to fuel you up fast when you're on the go or just sitting down to eat a meal itself. Two minutes in the microwave and boom, your meal is ready to eat. Not to mention with their 34 different meal types as well as over 36 add-on options like smoothies, juices, snacks, and customizing the actual meals that show up to your house to begin with, Factor ensures that I can eat healthy. And also, this is not just a sponsor thing that like, oh, I don't actually buy it. I literally have a subscription to them as I was impressed with their meal choices and the amount of nutrition I was getting from them fueling my workouts. So for me, it's cut down on grocery store trips, unhealthy snacking, and has helped me stick to my health goals as eating food that's actually good for me is apparently a good thing. And it's really always been my weak point. So by heading the link in the description or going to go.factor75.com forward slash Roanoke60 and using code Roanoke60, you can get 60% off your first factor box and try it out for yourself today. All right, let's get back to it. Let's first and foremost get this portion out of the way. If you haven't played it or don't want the game spoiled for you because you are currently playing it, this thing is about to be inundated with spoilers. But it's kind of necessary to discuss the aspect because the story is absolutely what made me keep going when playing this game. If it had a weak story, I would have just put it down and likely never picked it back up again. Sort of like why I never cover Prototype. The game just kind of felt boring to me. Callisto, on the other hand, did not. This game makes me excited to see where they're going to take the story itself with the sequel, and given the feedback I'm sure that they are receiving, they can hone it in and make it a much more fun and fluid game. And I'm also going to try something. I'll be explaining the story here, but I will put a timestamp up on screen so that you can bypass the actual story itself to kind of limit spoilers, but even on the other side, I gotta tell you, when talking about the characters, there still will be some spoilers, just not as many. So if you want to skip to that point, and the timestamp should be up on screen now, go ahead and head there, but let's get to it. The year is 2320, and things aren't happening and cool within the Sol system. Humanity has begun branching out to the moons of Jupiter and establishing colonies. And much like the colonies in new areas on Earth, there are those that thrive, and then there's those that perish. Europa seemed to have a major colony on it, but seemingly an attack happened, which was coordinated by Danny Nakamura. However, something does seem amiss while she's walking around the colony, finding younglings laying on the ground. We now meet our main man, Jacob Lee. Excellent first name, and horrifying later when his name gets whispered. He's been tasked with several other cargo ship pilots to ship these medical supplies from Europa to Callisto. However, during his last transport, his ship gets boarded by Danny and her group. In an effort to escape, he blows the back hatch, but Danny then breaks through the window to the crew area, causing a depressurization issue. This causes the ship to crash into Callisto, taking out his co-pilot Max on impact. A rescue group is then sent out containing the Leg Destroyer 9000 robots, as well as a man named Captain Ferris. Taking Danny into custody, he gets a call from the Warden to also take Jacob into custody. His protests fall on deaf ears the entire time as he's equipped with a brainstem implant that allows him to be tracked and have his biological processes assessed visually. As he passes out from the pain of having that thing just raw-dogged into his spinal cord, he then wakes up and hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. After hallucinating his co-pilot Max reading at him, he's able to open his cell door as Black Iron Prison has descended into chaos. What appears to be a prison break is actually just a mad dash for survival, with some prisoners succumbing to something in their cells while others are just getting got in the distance. Exiting your cell, you run across a man named Elias, who wants to get out of here and knows the facility by heart and can lead the way. But the catch is, he needs you to pilot a ship that he's planning on stealing, but he needs one more inmate that just arrived to hack into the system. As they head to get this mystery third prisoner, I think we all know who it is. El, I mean Danny. Danny attacks Jacob as he enters her cell to get her, locking him in there as Elias is confused as to what's happening. Danny refuses to help the two, and then says later nerds as the cell is transported to a different part of the facility. Things are looking relatively bleak at this point, but Elias says screw it, we will form our own escape plan without her, and they'll have blackjack and hookers. So they continue to make it up as they go along. Moving through the air production facility, they put on a definitely not dead space suit and have to head out onto the surface of Callisto to jack the ship and GTFO. While discussing the plan, however, they get attacked 
attacked by Captain Douche Nozzle, aka Ferris, who's hulking out from your original interaction with him earlier because he's the warden's special little guy. Ferris has been infected by this mystery biophage, but unlike the others who completely lose their humanity, he is able to retain a lot of it, although obviously he's a little more aggressive. Then again, Ferris wasn't really a cool dude to begin with, and probably because his name is Ferris. They end up getting ejected back out onto the surface, which then damages Elias' suit, causing him to suffocate in Jacob's arms. And I stop here to remind you, you can survive up to six minutes without oxygen before brain damage sets in. And it's cold on Callisto, so you may have even more time. Danny heroically shows up literally seconds after Elias passes out, and then cuts out his implant, taking probably a piece of his brainstem with her to retrieve his memories when literally they could have just brought him back onto the giant transporter right there that has oxygen and performed CPR for a few seconds and likely got him back. But oh well, brainstem destruction is preferable. So Danny talks mad smack to Jacob about how he sucks and how Elias was just a means to an end, which I didn't pick that up at all. But hey, I'm also not the guy who just cut out a brainstem three seconds after another dude just passed out. After accessing Elias's memories, she decides maybe the mutated people running around with some mystery biophage do actually pose a threat to her survival, and she should probably at least get some help. So reluctantly, she teams up with Jacob. They both then head to the ship so Jacob can pilot them out of there, but actually making it to the ship, who could have predicted this? As the thing is called out of orbit to descend, the warden shows up, pulling out the anti-ship munitions, and blowing the thing up. In the process of it being blown out of the sky, it then crashes into the two as they are knocked off the platform and deep within a fissure in Callisto. Falling out of the sky, don't mess up like I did a few times because I wasn't even paying attention to the prompt to grab stuff that was flying past me. Should you actually be good at the game, grabbing an outcropping of metal, you are able to stop yourself from going splat, and then you end up at the original colony that was on Callisto known as Arcus. Arcus was an attempt to get a more permanent human presence on Callisto, with mining operations being conducted as their main source of support. While digging, however, they came across something odd and brought it back up to the surface. Well, it didn't so much get brought back up to the surface as it attacked them, and then they had to take it out, and then it was brought to the surface. So, now here's where fiction actually meets reality. Callisto is a pretty sizable moon, IRL. It is hypothesized that under its icy exterior, there's actually an ocean of liquid salty water warmed by the core of its moon. Those would be something like on Earth, like hydrothermal vents. Honestly, if it had formed closer to our sun, it may have even been more habitable. What's even more interesting is, once the sun enters its red giant phase, it may actually provide enough warmth for both Callisto and Titan to get biological processes moving to start life or make it more habitable than they are right now. Of course, if we haven't left our solar system by that point, humanity is already doomed. Moving on. After unearthing this creature, experiments began to be conducted in an effort to accelerate human evolution. This, however, went about as well as you'd imagine. Much like Black Iron Prison, this caused a whole bunch of people to change, pretty much the whole colony, which led to its collapse. You still find remnants of the colonists down there in the dark as rapid evolution took over and made them lose their eyesight, but now they have increased hearing abilities. During the outbreak, the UJC stepped in because now well, they basically just took out an entire colony for what they call science. Taking out infected and uninfected alike, we came across one person in particular who was known as Subject Zero. Subject Zero, much like Ferris, was infected but retained their humanity at least somewhat. They were, however, taken out by security forces, so it really didn't matter. This was of great interest to the UJC, so they built Black Iron on top of Arcus. Jacob is tasked with trying to get out of Arcus at this point and reunite with Danny after a collapse separates them, which then later on she absorbs the colonists' memories in their living space, and we get the most game-breaking point in this entire playthrough, the train ride to Arcus. I'll complain about this later, having canonically survived this encounter, but not survived this encounter 38 times in my own home, Jacob and Danny are able to escape, but run back into Ferris, who's looking hilarious, but Danny is infected in the process because she's a big scrub. Returning to Black Iron Prison, the murder bots are back online as they knock out Jacob and then drag him back to his cell, separating him once more from Danny. Struggling with a bout of depression as everything he just did seemingly meant nothing and he's literally back in his cell, he gets a call from the doctor who stabbed him in the brainstem earlier. And now she's all about ethics and we have to do the right thing, blah blah blah. She tells him, look, I know everyone is mutating and the robots are trying to cut your legs off and turn your brain into jelly, but you should come to my lab. It'll be worth it. I can probably cure Danny. So she unlocks his cell and once again, he's off. It becomes apparent as he's making his way there that all the cells are actually monitoring stations and this whole thing is one giant science experiment. The warden is under the impression that forcing this rapid evolution in a controlled environment wouldn't yield the results that he actually wanted. He needed it to be raw and real, so he just released it and said good luck. His whole attempt was to try and make a Subject Zero once more. See, that's why if you've actually never been in a STEM field, you probably shouldn't be making these choices. I mean, hey, look at the uh, the people that write the news the last three years. Man, journalists really need to shut up. Soapbox aside, the Warden also belongs to a para-religious cult that also believes it's up to humans to force their evolution into basically godhood and spread amongst the stars. Look, spreading amongst the stars is great. I agree with half of that, but godhood? I don't know, man. I don't think 
think humans are ever gonna get that way. And I feel like we could change environments to match us rather than having to change us to match environments. Although arguably probably changing us would be easier. But getting to the lab, Jacob gets told the whole lowdown on how he can cure Danny after reuniting with her. He needs a sample from the new Alpha, which just so happens to be Captain Ferris. It is also revealed that Danny's sister was taken out on Europa, which is why she's pretty upsetty spaghetti. And also it turns out Jacob was aware of transporting something that probably should have been reported, but hey, he just wanted to finish up this job and get out of there because it's all about that money money. Ah yeah, that's great. Anyways, feeling responsible for this, Jacob goes and attempts to get the sample and then runs into the warden. The warden is meeting with a bunch of people who are other holographic figures and like animal masks and devil masks because they're absolute betas, I guess. I don't know. The warden then wants to show the difference between a mutated alpha male and a human sigma male. Joke old yet? Was the second it came out. So a fight ensues to which if you mess up, you will be ended in the most disrespectful way imaginable. Like your face gets caved in and then your, I mean, your skull obviously wouldn't be structurally sound. So then you can literally just pop your head like a cherry tomato. It sucks. Anyways, continuing to fight with Ferris, he shirks his human form for the form that can literally tear you in half while these dumb crawling exploders, which I hate on an otherworldly level at this point, they took me out 15 times. I counted. Like, yeah, I get it. We were supposed to use these clunky force gauntlet thing to like throw them around, but holy Lord, if this wasn't a another super annoying part of the game. No, you're the one with the skill issue. But eventually, Jacob is able to overcome the Omega Male, known as Ferris Monster Mash, and get his sample. The Warden now presents Jacob with a choice. Give the sample back to the Warden and survive, or give it to Danny, and he blows this whole thing up. We don't really get to choose because Jacob does the right thing and injects Danny, curing her. As the Warden goes to overload the reactors, they run to the escape pod he had mentioned earlier. Getting to the room, there's only one left. Sure, there may be a little more cuddling than normal, but I think they both could have fit. All I know is if I was Jacob, 100% I'm cuddling Danny. Bro, I'm not staying on a blown up moon. So anyways, Jacob places Danny inside with the alien life form so she can expose the whole thing and then she's blasted into space. Assuming we're done? Nope. Jacob is still fighting the good fight down there as he gets a call from Mahler. She activated a failsafe on the reactors to stop them from going critical. As he talks to her, she tells him that there may be a way that they both can escape together. While doing this though, Ferris shows back up in his human form, ready to get his cheeks clapped once more now that the dumb crawling exploder annoyance isn't there to help him. Callisto Protocol does have a lot right with it. It's just when it comes to the details, it has a lot wrong with it as well. Some would even say a few of the problems will likely run a lot of people off from the franchise in general if this is their first step into it, which sort of blows considering we need all the successful survivor horror games we can get at this point with EA constantly bellowing out that campaigns don't sell games and we need to cram multiplayer into everything for some god awful reason. Like Dead Space 2, what even was that? I mean, it was quasi fun, but bruh. All right, so anyways, where was I? Ah, yes. So there are things that this game did exceedingly well. I only finished it though in some of the tougher areas because I had to see the conclusion of the story. But with that said, even in of itself, I wanted to put the thing down and go screech at the heavens because after being torn in half for the fourth time, I was beginning to question what in the name of God was I even doing. The game is engaging. The story felt satisfying throughout, if a little slower than I would have liked. There were absolutely parts of the storyline where I was like, okay, cool, escape from prison, go to Arcus, and then I'm back in prison, which made me think, man, I was really this close to the lab to begin with. This story could have actually been 20 minutes. And then in a lot of ways, I would say they were padding the runtime of the game because you will crawl through everything. Even when there doesn't really need to be a reason that you're shimmying across something, you're gonna shimmy and it's gonna take forever. I can't begin to tell you how many things in this game are just there to kind of slow you down so you just don't run through it. But anyhow, the plot made you care throughout, which is kind of what kept, again, me going. When I got to Arcus, I had no idea that there was an entire other colony that had already had an outbreak 75 years previously and it's not mentioned anywhere until you just happen to stumble across it. And on top of that, them breaking through the subsurface ocean and finding a living creature down there only for security forces to take it out, but it's still sort of like a form of infection that altered people to monsters through increased evolution. That stuff is cool to me. I mean, look me in the eyes and say that's not just a pretty neat premise that will be really fun to discuss in my biological breakdown videos over this game. So take the infection process alone. It's literally chef's kiss. The slow infection time until it overwhelms your mind, forcing you to decay back into a more primitive beast. Every cell appears to be out for itself, but still working in unison, jacking the human form to tear apart other people to clearly add to whatever biomass that is growing all over the compound, which you absolutely know. We're going to be discussing that in my totic abilities and cancer cell propagation outside the human body. But not all is perfect in Callisto, however. While the story keeps you pushing, it has terrible pacing to it. I found myself at certain points feeling like I was actually doing nothing, or there were things I had to do, like turning on power for a room that clearly already has power to it, and I felt like it was busy work a lot of the time, or reuniting with Danny for like literally the third time just to fall off a ledge and then be separated. Another part was technically you could go fast or as slow as you want, and maybe this is just a personal gripe, but the game would present two doors, right? Like literally two doors. One was a giant loop, and the other was to progress 
progress the storyline, but you never knew which was which. So sometimes if you wanted to explore, you would just accidentally progress the storyline and be unable to go back. Sometimes if you wanted to go like just get this task over with, you spent an extra 15 minutes running this loop, which was annoying trying to get footage for this review. Like there was no designation as to which was which. On top of that, the final boss or the big bad Captain Ferris didn't really feel like a good boss to me. Well, obviously you didn't want to get punched in the face by this dude or torn in half in his second form. He showed up, I think maybe twice throughout the whole game. And even then he literally just showed up. He was never like talking smack throughout the game, getting you amped to take him out. He wasn't thwarting you and really doing anything except maybe opening a door and getting you literally blasted out on the Callisto surface, which is what you were going to do anyways. He just sort of shows up and you have to fight him. Basically no build up to his character, which I would hope there would have been more. And then what was the deal with the ending? Captain Ferris mutated into a giant monster, right? We literally took him out. Almost a blast to a face just sort of knocked him out. And then he just changes back to his quasi-human form with no rhyme or reason to do a jump scare. While it's very Nicole-esque, and I will say I'm not hating on that direction, I just didn't understand why he got back up after receiving a complete ass kicking. However, it does leave on a cliffhanger, so I am excited to see where it goes from here. The combat was ultra satisfying in some aspects, but downright annoying in others. The issue was the enemies don't feel like they're responding to one another sometimes, and you would need superhuman levels of reaction time to deal with them. That said, the fighting is fast paced, you know, break a leg, break their skull and take them out. But there is an absolute rage fest when you take on several of them at a time and knock them all down. I mean, it is, it is pretty good. You feel like a Giga Chad from that point on. On top of that with the combat though, you do get to upgrade your stuff, which is pretty nice. There are some issues visually, which I could see was kind of a little lackluster for lack of a better term. In some ways with the force multipliers, you could see things being added onto the actual weapon to change the way it attacks. However, with your main weapon, the thing you will be using the most, which is the stun baton, Upgrading it does not cause any visual changes, which to me was kind of a huge letdown. With the lighter material upgrade, why not make holes in it that are reinforced with another alloy? With the blocking mechanism increase, show that maybe it's wider or it can get wider. With the attack force increase, show me something being altered about the main weapon that is causing it now to hit harder. The upgrade process shows none of this, which is a minor detail, but it would have been appreciated. I think that's sort of the issue with the game. Overall, it looks awesome and plays pretty well. You know, especially with later updates that are probably going to stay stabilize a little bit. We'll get into that. But it's sort of like death by a thousand cuts. The devil is in the details and it makes it feel unfinished. With that said, I am a huge proponent of upgrading stuff and I love being able to change the way things look. It felt so good with so much dopamine to spend my money, you know, the Callisto credits, not my money, on upgrading anything that I could. Sort of like when you upgrade Isaac's suit in Dead Space 1, you can see the changes in the armor as it increased in strength. Again, this isn't Dead Space, but from the same guy, it's clear what they were going for in some aspects and I just wish it could have been fleshed out a little more. But with all that said, the combat does suffer to a degree. There are several times when you get into a rhythm of combat, right? As you fight, you begin to feel what the enemy is going to do next and can react appropriately. However, there are enemies that have ranged attacks that while typically when engaging a group, they will let you finish your attack, the ranged ones will not. It will break the rhythm of combat and then open you up to devastating hits, more so on higher difficulties. Now, it does come with a caveat. In the game, you can actually activate auto dodge, which can help you, but I'm going to call you a complete nerd if you do that. But speaking of breaking combat rhythm, there has been like several times throughout with the Exploder variant in particular that I had a problem with. When you're fighting Captain Ferris, these guys will come out of nowhere and be like, hey bro, good to see you. We're here to be thrown at Captain Ferris. As then they chain explode around you one after the other, knocking you down in just enough succession, giving Ferris enough time to come clap your cheeks. Basically for a melee game of yin and yang, it felt really off. Oh, but I can hear you now. Roanoke, you scrub, use the force. I mean, use the grip. And if you didn't know, the grip is basically the kinesis from Dead Space, but it's actually a nod to the Force through the animations in Star Wars. I forget which game it is, but I read that. Pretty interesting. Also, fun fact, I found the PUBG helmet in the game as well, because if you remember, Callisto Protocol was supposed to be in the PUBG universe. And also, also fun fact, I found the Dead Space save locations. But that's what I love about this game, is it's not like all these predecessors. Anyhow, the grip is broken as all get out. I don't know if it was just me or what the issue was, but half the time I would grab people and they would just drop, even though I had full charge. I would also try to like throw them off the train or into a spiked wall and it just wouldn't do it. It was rather frustrating. I would check the charge and yeah, it would be full. It felt clunky and once again, unfinished. I don't want to be all negative, obviously. It was a fun game when half the time it did work, but the other half it was just really frustrating because all I accomplished was wasting time while other enemies approached and literally just pulled this thing closer to me, which as you might imagine on that freaking train is not a great amount of fun. Now I bet you're thinking, well Roanoke, at least the characters made it, right? <laughs> Wrong! I mean, I guess some of them did. I think the issue is they just didn't develop them enough. And man, I'm really starting to sound like I'm hating on this game, but again, I have to tell you, I did enjoy it, but again, it's not without its flaws. That's why
why the Callisto Protocol 2 Electric Boogaloo is going to be lit, because it'll have a chance to refine all the characters in combat in a way that makes it more enjoyable. And you know, I gotta give reverence to our man Glenny Boy out there orchestrating these horror games, because seriously, they're really cool ideas. But let's talk about our main man, Jacob. First off, excellent name. I felt like I was specifically being talked to half the time, which definitely immersed me more in the story, which is probably why I was able to enjoy it so much. In fact, there was this one part when you're walking through solitary and you hear Jacob get whispered loudly, and that got me when I had a headset on. Jacob. Where it failed, however, was I didn't really understand him as a character. First, it's clear he found something in the cargo that was bad, right? Then he lies the whole time and then has a flashback about it, and I didn't understand how he forgot transporting the biophage and how it was a big reveal to us. I mean, we are the main character, and if he remembered, that means the whole time? I, I don't know. It, it just really didn't work very well. Jacob never really developed as a character, but I guess kind of changed due to his surroundings. The whole time, other characters would be like, oh, Jacob, you suck. You're really concerned about your own survival. But I never saw that anywhere in the game. In fact, Jacob tried to help Elias and pull him to cover, but he couldn't get up. Jacob and his co-pilot Max got sucked down to Callisto, and Max paid the price because it was a ship crash. Not because Jacob was going in half-cocked. They were just completing a job. Like, things happen. Danny the whole time is bashing him, as well for just completing the job, and even if he found the biophage, he's not a scientist. He has no idea of what that is. Like, I'm sure there's been people transporting stuff all the time, even on Earth, right now, that they're like, what is that? And they don't know. They're just like, well, I'm here to transport. That's all I care about. So the warden ends it all again by telling him, like, that he was only concerned with his own survival, and he's been watching him. Again, how? It's never shown to me. Everyone was trying to survive, and Jacob was actually willingly teaming up with others to survive. It's like, on the one hand, they were telling me Jacob was this bad guy, but on the other hand, and they're showing me nothing that actually made him a bad guy. There's the classic phrase of show me, don't tell me. But because of this lack of development, I never really felt attached to him like the other protagonists in other games that I've played. I mean, sure, you didn't want him to die in horrible ways, but throughout, there was like no point where I felt much for his character because by the end, I still had no clue who this dude really was or why he was here or even his personality that much. And again, this game is not Dead Space, but I'm gonna have to compare it in the cold sweat factor, right? When I played Dead Space 1, I felt attached to Isaac even though he really didn't talk. Like, it was just what he was going through. All this crappy stuff. It made you feel something for him, right? And then when I got torn in half at the end by the hive mind, I was like, I literally busted out in a cold sweat, and I was like, oh my god, that was horrible. Jacob dies in terrible ways. Like, like I said, your head gets popped like a cherry tomato, or you get torn in half, but there was never, like, a cold sweat moment where I was like, man, that really sucks. It was just kind of like, oh, that's a cool animation, I guess. Like, you gotta make me feel something. And Elias was actually another character like this. They really wanted you to attach to Elias and feel something when he meets his end, but it just doesn't make any sense to me. First off, when you get blasted out of the airlock on Callisto's surface, I mean, I get it. Callisto's a, you know, it has a very tenuous atmosphere composed of carbon dioxide. In fact, Earth, I believe, has an atmosphere 40 billion times more dense than Callisto, and this would clearly cause a depressurization event blasting the two out of the airlock. But how did Elias get all the way out there with a broken visor? The dude was literally so far away. So with his death, it was just sort of like, uh, okay, random dude who's been helping me, but I still know very little about. I get he's got a backstory like everyone else, a murderer who was fighting, apparently, and it was in self-defense, but still, it just, there was too much, too much weird stuff that just didn't connect, I think, in the way that they wanted it to. But apart from that, there is a quasi-bond that is formed, but somehow, it's never really fleshed out to show us that it mattered, and after that, Jacob, uh, he still kind of takes the brunt of all the criticism for working with him to escape, to ensure their survival. Again, what? Danny, the whole time, didn't really even need to be in the game, I think. Now, clearly, they are going for the Ellie route, but Ellie had time to be developed and only begrudgingly helped you throughout the game until finally agreeing to work with Isaac. Danny thinks you're the scum of the earth due to what she thinks you did on Europa, but then helps you anyways. With Ellie, she just didn't want anybody else around her so that she could survive. So with Danny, why would she help you? She didn't need you before, and it just seems randomly that she decides on a whim, maybe you aren't that bad of a dude, but it's never shown why she believes that. Finding the medical gear on your ship potentially cleared Jacob, but then their bond comes out of nowhere with Jacob deciding to cure her and stay together, even sacrificing himself at the end because he can't keep running from what he's done. He was on a cargo job! Like, bro, it is what it is. Anyways, I, it's too much, like, I get personal responsibility, but you were just doing your job, and there's the whole concept of, oh, just doing your job doesn't excuse it, but how are you supposed to know what that thing is? That could have just been a tissue sample from a native creature on Europa, and they're deciding to study it. They don't know what it is. So, that's my whole thing. If they think that Jacob is such a bad dude, and that, like, he's this complete chotch bag, why 
is it at every turn does he do the right thing? So moving on to the warden, who's been talking the most shit. Big scary boss man, holographic control, everything behind the scenes, and make terrible assumptions about people. This guy is just a complete non-issue. More than 90% of the time, he's just a pre-recording, issuing orders for a pilot to be put in jail for some reason, horrendously assuming biophages need chaos to change, and everything this dude did, it, it again makes no sense. His plan was poorly devised. His actions about his alpha versus humanity was completely stupid. His evolution made no sense. Trying to change the human genome to adapt to space is probably the way to go, but clearly these creatures' adaptations are for Callisto, not space. How does he even know that it's going to work in space to begin with? Because of this, him and Captain Ferris are like two peas in a pod, because moving on to Captain Ferris, this guy is just a giant douche canoe who from the drop just hates you for some reason. It's not shown if he knows the warden's plans or not, but he just follows everything to a T. And bear in mind, there are informational logs that you can collect on, I believe, everyone, but most of the time, they're just randoms talking about what's happening during the outbreak. It tells about the sort of people the warden really had transferred, and they're usually people who were brutal and let go of service at their old job and then transferred there so they can conduct this experiment. Captain Ferris, I would have to assume, is one of these, but bro, there's no time to warm up to this dude or anything from the drop. He just hates you, you're the scum of the earth, and he's gonna take you to jail for no other reason than somebody told him to do it. So with how positive this video is, let's move on to some more issues. Wouldn't want it to be all sunshine and rainbows, I know, right? There are some major, like, actually legitimately game-breaking areas and issues, at least in my mind. Take that for what you will. The first is the actual ability to play this game. This is one of the most unstable games I think I have on my Series S right now. In fact, while trying to get footage, I noticed something. My first playthrough of the game, it crashed maybe two or three times. But this playthrough, I had it crash nine times. There appears to have been some sort of update according to my downloads. I could be wrong about that, but whatever happened made it even less stable on the Xbox. Prior to this, the issue seemed to really be only on PC. The game would crash consistently, there was stutter, drop frames, textures wouldn't load. In fact, going through and looking at the footage that I collected, you guys can see it. The, the frames just dropped drastically. It's not your computer, it's not my recording software, that's just how the game looked. In fact, I was talking to While Such Gaming the other day while getting footage, and he mentioned the ridiculously long loading times for him, and he's on the Series X. For me, I just had the crashes. This issue is absolutely going to be remembered. When anyone plays it, sadly, they will remember this was the biggest issue being the stability, and that will in turn turn a lot of people off towards giving it a chance later, which is a bummer, but it's understandable. I wouldn't be surprised if people are looking for refunds at this point, and you may be inclined to believe it's associated with your rig. Well, sort of. PC and Xbox appear to have the most issues. PS5, strangely enough, seems to be the best platform to run it on, which has sparked a conspiracy theory that people from Sony, who helped on the project, sabotaged it. Glenn came out and said that this isn't true, and I'm inclined to believe him on it, but it still is a problem that needs to be fixed ASAP. During my two playthroughs, for some reason, when you go to drain the sewers, uh, speaking of textures, so that you can actually go through them, the textures would fail to load, and they failed to load twice. The first time, I don't have footage of it, but moving through the area where the guy's like glued to the wall, it's on all the trailers, and he looks at you, he was literally melted plastic. Then the fight after with the crawling variants, they also look like melted plastic. The screens didn't load properly in that area either, and it was pretty bad. And it remains that way until you climb down the ladder and out of the area. Again, I don't know why the textures refuse to load in that area of the game for me, but it is immersion breaking and makes it look hilariously bad. It's the details in this game, like 100%. They lost the forest through the trees sort of mentality. Another annoying issue that I had like several other people who played it are the save points themselves. They're actually not even really save points. They're simply checkpoints. They're predetermined areas of the game where a save appears and you cannot save past that. Again, comparing to Dead Space, this is how it would go. You would find a save station, go to it, save, and that's where you were. So say like, let's say you upgraded your armor and the weapons that you have, and then you saved, then went to a boss fight. Your armor and weapons would remain upgraded and allow you to hit the boss again, not having to waste any time. Well, that's not so in Callisto. There is one part of the game, again, it's the train to Arcus, where it's a little difficult, especially on harder difficulties. And on the hardest difficulty, it's a monumental pain in the ass. I got caught in a loop of dying because one missed perfect dodge or the pattern is broken and you're just sort of like completely annihilated. Then you come back. So uh, I had an awesome idea. Okay, first I'll upgrade everything and then I'll save. So I upgraded everything, saved, then I went and attacked and I died. All right, so no big deal. I saved afterwards. Well, to my surprise, no, I didn't. It was just the checkpoint earlier. There is no point to the manual save in the pause screen because all it does is save you to an autosave, which was the checkpoint. Now, a case could be made if you want to save specifically in chapter below or whatever, or, you know, further along in the game. Like, I get it, but it's really, there's no point. It was just a added in feature that doesn't need to be there at all because it really does nothing. I did this again, the trainer arc is about 25 times until I finally broke through to the actual waves and then got to the boss, where then I only died like three times.
times. Again, you could say it's a skill issue. I wouldn't blame you, but I do play a lot of horror survival games and I'm used to dying in them. But at a certain point, I, it just started to seem more and more like a pain in the ass getting past this point. I started to think I was doing something wrong at some point. So I actually looked it up and I saw like a ton of other people were having the same issue with this train ride. It was just a tough point in the game and the comments were filled with people saying they just noped out of the game at that point and they weren't planning on coming back. Now, I am sure there's those that made it through in the first try and they think I suck. Way to go, alpha male. But on harder difficulties, again, it blew. On top of that, I had one of my crashes on the fourth wave of enemies, which turned out to be the last wave, but before the boss got there, so there was no save. Most of what got me killed was trying to use the grip to throw enemies off the platform, which because of the clunkiness wasn't working as well either. Eventually, I just expended all of my shotgun ammo just to have Two-Face crawl over a box and then start attacking me. I'm starting to sound like a game journalist. I would say this part of the game maybe should have not passed game testing, unless you turn on the auto dodge, at which point you are a game journalist. I didn't, so I probably could have survived more, had I, I guess. I don't know. So now, this is not so much game breaking. These are things that I'd like to see done in the game. Obviously, we need, not want, a new game plus option. This game is literally built for a second and third playthrough just to upgrade basically everything because there's no way to currently upgrade everything to max if you just go through the game and play as normal. In fact, I think if you sought out every infected and every piece of loot, you still couldn't reach max. There's just simply not enough things to sell or enemies to loot to get enough Callisto credits, so it just, you need that second playthrough. On top of this, the armor is really cool, but you only get it about two-thirds of the way through the game. I want to be able to wear it from the drop or upgrade it or something, but instead, it increases your inventory space by, I believe, by about four and gives you more health and armor, but apart from that, you can't really alter it in any way. This also makes it feel like an afterthought, much like the other areas of the game. Like, there are good ideas in here, but they were never fully explored, and because of that, it just feels like a prop more than anything. I think that's actually the best way to explain Callisto Protocol. It feels like a Hollywood prop scene. Nothing has any substance to it, but it's there to convey an idea that actually does have some weight. But because of how the game is built, it just leaves a lot to be desired. I'd also like to see the upgrades fixed and new visual changes on them after altering them be implemented. The main weapon, the stun baton, should absolutely have changes done to it when upgrading, since that's the thing you'll be using the most. Having it look the same from level 1 to max attack, max block breaking, and max block is just kind of lazy, in my personal opinion. The pacing, while too late to fix now, could have been more consistent with Callisto Protocol 2, and we probably need less shimmying. There's no need for all the shimmying, for the love of God. I feel like Striking Distance is just getting their footing with the game, and this was their first attempt, which means they can get better from here. That's how you can look at Callisto. This is a first attempt. Things can get better, as all the core pieces there to make a game great, I mean, they're here. They're just not connected well enough to form a complete idea. The final point I want to talk about is the death animation scandal. One of the things that has been brought up and should just be put to rest is the season pass locking death animations behind paywalls. This has to do with the DLC animations, which likely means new enemy types, and with it, again, new animations. That being behind a paywall makes sense, as I recall with most games, you have to buy the DLC for them. People got upset thinking that they're going to put the old animations in the campaign behind paywalls and then make you pay for the new ones. It just, that wasn't the case. And this was confirmed by Glenn on Twitter, so we can stop spazzing out about that. Not really sure why. I think people just want to be angry about the game, which makes sense, given it sort of blue balls you a little about being a good game that's right there, but it's just not enough. What I really like about this game, because I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, totally just bash it, the game, despite its flaws, is fun to play. Again, it's absolutely satisfying taking down a group that was destroying you earlier. The aspect of stealthing past enemies or taking them out honestly reminded me of The Last of Us in a lot of ways. The story kept me engaged to the point that even when I was frustrated with the gameplay, I wanted to keep playing to figure out what was going to happen next. The gore and death animations are a thing of beauty, with the caveat being they become a little too scripted and repetitive if you die too much like me. Callisto Protocol in general, getting a bad rap, people, uh, they just kind of wanted it to be like Dead Space, and it's not Dead Space, it's Callisto Protocol. You need to examine it through a lens of a completely new IP. There is a ton of fan service in the game, which is awesome. Call it the Dead Space, the Force, PUBG, and that's there for you to enjoy, not bring the game down because you think it should be Dead Space. And I also would hazard a guess as to say, in the future, with how difficult Callisto is, I bet you it's probably going to take on maybe a little bit of Dark Souls quality on, yeah, the game is difficult, but it's supposed to be difficult. But overall, the story itself, I really enjoyed. Easily, the story is an 8 out of 10. The combat, being a little janky. However, it kind of decreases the overall fun, and I found myself exceedingly frustrated with the game at certain points. Probably, again, a skill issue. There were parts that just flat out felt like it shouldn't have gotten past quality testing. Overall, the game for me, it's about a 6.5, maybe a 7 out of 10. It's not the best. It needs way more polish, and it felt like it was released with issues and lack of features. That story, though, 
It was a blast. If you've been on the fence, I would say uh, maybe give it a little more time to resolve the texture and stability and non-playability issues through updates. But the game itself, for the story alone, is definitely worth playing. It's a good game, but it isn't perfect. And likely, uh, they should have had probably worked out some of the kinks prior to releasing it. Still, give it a chance, but don't view it through the lens of being Dead Space 4, because that's not what they were going for, and that's not what this game is about. But I want to thank you guys for watching. If you made it this far, let me know what you thought about my breakdown. It's nice to do something different every once in a while, but definitely expect biological breakdowns of these creatures in the future. We're definitely going to be getting into that. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our two astronauts, Lipsy Genji and Wesley A. Weaver Jr. Thank you guys. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Des Dancer, as well as Phoenix, and our scientists, Countryside Limbo, Lucani, and Vibing Shockwave. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and it's greatly appreciated all right so that's gonna do it for me i hope everyone enjoyed and i'll see y'all in the next one for some biological breakdowns